to a safer place Equipped my hands and feet with strength So I advance with confidence in Christ His precious truth delivers me From lies that wage a war in me Your victory is mine for all I will not be afraid, for my hope is in His name, who is a rock but our God, whose blood has sealed our freedom, Jesus. Well, welcome to chapel, everyone. Let's give a round of applause for our instrumentalists, Tierra and McKinsey. It's awesome to have a couple other instruments. Well, if you guys aren't already standing, looks like everyone is, we're going to go ahead and join in worship this morning. I'm glad you all are here. Going to have a great time of worship and word this morning.
Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour out speech, and night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, but their message has gone out to the whole earth, and their words to the ends of of the world. All of creation testifies to the majesty and the glory and the beauty of King Jesus. And today we're going to make a big deal about King Jesus as we gather together to worship. We have a very special guest speaker today, Brother John McCallum, who is the pastor of First Baptist Hot Springs, who drove all the way over here this morning to be with us. And uh, I know that. Uh, you guys are going to be especially blessed by the word that he brings today in chapel. So let's continue on worshiping together our Lord. stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself it's not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things are.
Stand strong and worship you, and if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings, I'll hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you, because death is just the doorway into it. so grateful to be here this morning and to be lifting your name in praise. God, I pray that what we just sing, what we just sang is in our hearts, that you'll be magnified, that you would be our focus, that you would be our life. And we realize that your life, your death, your resurrection, we are united with you in that. And we have new life when our faith is in you. We thank you so much. In your name we pray.
Well, good morning, and thank you for coming to chapel. I don't know if it's required or not, but uh, appreciate you being here. I want to thank uh, Ryan Putman for inviting me to come, and uh, always good to see Dr. Norman again, and my friend Walter Norville. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be honored to be back. I see some familiar faces. I'm grateful for the innovating things that Williams is doing. That's doing a lot for Arkansas Baptists and for the kingdom of God. And so I bring you greetings today from the Spa City uh, and from one of your alumni, Tyler Lee. Tyler is our associate worship pastor and uh, is doing a great job. You guys train him very well uh, for the ministry. So I appreciate that. Now, uh, with all of that uh, about training for ministry, I'm going to make just a brief commercial. Uh, our church voted to fund a, a two-person pastoral apprenticeship. Uh, it's 10 months. It'll start at the middle of August. It'll go through the middle of June. Ideally, it'll be for, for folks who feel called to be a pastor, and it will be an immersive experience. Um, those who participate in this will have an opportunity to do essentially everything that a pastor does. And we'll have the opportunity to learn from some really, really sharp people uh, that, that we will get you uh, in touch with, in contact with, give you a chance to do some networking. It'd be great for somebody who thinks that they want to be a pastor's planner to go to seminary next year, but says, you know, I'll do seminary online for a year and experience in the field pastoral work, uh, the rhythms of a pastorate. So, uh, if you want to do that, I've left some, some flyers for that with uh, Dr. Norville and Dr. Putman, and you can uh, pick those, pick one up, and it has a link to submit an online application. And we'd love, love to have you in Hot Springs if God uh, is in that for you. All right, that's enough of that. Let's do what we came here to do, and that's to worship the Lord. Thank you for the, the band and the music that they've brought to get our hearts ready. I want to invite you, if you got your Bible or your phone or whatever you, whatever you use, to open it to Psalm 24. Psalm 24. I'm not sure that our nation, our world, the church ever needed Easter more than we needed it last Sunday. In social media exploding with posts about people coming back to church for the first time, uh, I saw posts of record attendances in churches, uh, a lot of visitors who don't go to anybody's church, People are hungry, you know, they're hungry for community, they're hungry for face-to-face -face worship, hungry for hope, hungry for Jesus, and in a season in which many in the church have put their hopes in some kind of political king, uh, people are hungry for a king who is larger and truer than that. The scriptures introduce us to that king. It has a kind of an Easter feel to it, and if it's all right with you, I just wanna linger a little longer with Easter, and I invite you to hear the word of the Lord. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord, for he laid its foundations on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who's not appealed to what is false, who's not sworn deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates, rise up, ancient doors, then the king of glory will come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, rise up, ancient doors, then the king of glory will come in. Who is he, this king of glory, the Lord of armies? He is the king of glory. Spent a little time recently doing a quick scan of some of history's greatest kings, the famous and the infamous, the noteworthy and the notorious, the benevolent and the tyrant. And many of these kings hold several things in common. They are land takers, lawmakers, history shakers, God fakers, friends of undertakers. Uh, they are judge and jury, full of fury, always in a hurry to elevate self. They make reforms, act like thunderstorms, and are very fond of uniforms. They are style pacers, women chasers, opposition erasers. They are arrogant and proud. 
They crave attention from the crowd and they make sure people bow in their presence. They wield power, live in a tower, make their subjects cower. They chase glory, they record their story. They want to live forever but are transitory. So they came and went, they wasted and spent, they crushed dissent, they rarely acted like gentlemen. And some of their subjects revere them, most fear them, some jeer them behind their backs. Much allegiance is grudging. So from tribal chieftains to Roman emperors to Russian czars to totalitarian dictators to monarchical kings to prime ministers and presidents, all exercise power in ways that advance personal agendas more than the country's needs and goals. Some are benevolent, some put their subjects ahead of themselves, some are much loved by those over whom they reign, but those are the exceptions. Most kings, by and large, are in it for themselves. May I tell you about one king who isn't? He is the king of glory. Who is this king of glory, you ask? Well, he's the sovereign creator of all that is. Look at the first two verses of the psalm. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. For he laid its foundations on the seas, established it on the rivers. Who is this king of glory? He's the creator who brought order out of watery chaos. He's the creator of the earth that you stand on, the air you breathe, the body you inhabit, the nature you enjoy, and even the pets that give you pleasure. The king of glory created it all. And as creator, he is owner of it all. It's not your land, your creek, your mountain, or your trees. It belongs to him. It's not your body, your spouse, your mom, your child, your dog. It all belongs to him. It's not your professor, your student, your university. It belongs to him. And it's not your food, your house, your dorm room, or your car. Because all of that comes from earth's materials that God made and owns. And it's not your money either. Deuteronomy 8.18 declares, But remember, it is the Lord your God who gives you power to gain wealth. So everything you have belongs to the king of glory. You belong to him too. You may think that you don't. I'm own man. I'm own woman. That may be the most naive thing anyone has ever uttered. Do you control your life, really? We live under the illusion that we control our lives. I go where I want to go. I do what I want to do. I choose what I want to choose. Really? Did you choose to wreck your car last month? Did you choose to go to your cousin's funeral last year? Are you the one who controlled the tornado that crushed your neighbor's house? If you have such control over your life, why didn't you stop the COVID pandemic before it killed your grandmother? Annie Dillard says it well. We are most deeply asleep at the switch when we fancy we control any switches at all. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. I go where I want to go. I do what I want to do. I'm going to do this next year, and in five years, I'm going to do this, and in 20 years, I'm going to be here. Naivete on steroids. You are not the sovereign creator of all that is. You do not own this world or your life. You are not the king of glory. There is only one king of glory, Jesus, blessed Jesus. Listen to the Apostle Paul in Col Colossians 1, 15 through 17. The Son, S-O-N, Son, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Jesus is the King of glory. He's the sovereign creator and He's the owner of all that is. He's also worthy of worship. Look at verses 3 through 6. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who's not appealed to what is false, who's not sworn deceitfully. He will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Now, psalm scholars believe that, like Psalm 15, this psalm may well be what's called an entrance liturgy. 
a psalm for those who are on their way to the temple to worship God. Perhaps we get a foretaste in the great story in 2 Samuel chapter 6 where David brings the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem with singing and shouting and praising and dancing, an entrance liturgy, a call to worship. And the psalm also ties worship to Torah obedience. Clean hands and a pure heart, those are ethical terms. Not appealing to what is false, not swearing deceitfully imply concern for the truth of God and for the welfare of your neighbor. The truest worship of the king of glory doesn't spring from mere ritual nor from lip service. It springs from a lifestyle of Torah obedience. It springs from a desire to receive God's blessings and to seek God's face. And notice that the righteousness of God is received rather than achieved The worshiper will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Isn't that a foretaste of grace? I mean, it's through grace, the grace of the King of glory, that we can have clean hands, that we can have a pure heart, that we can live in right relationship with God and with neighbor. We can come to the King in worship because the King came to us first in creation, then then in covenant, then in Christ, now in the Holy Spirit, So all of our worship is not initiative, it's response. It is praise to his glory, it is gratitude for his blessings, it is confession for his forgiveness, it is the offering of a life made holy by the king of glory who who came to us, who comes to us, and who one day will come again in great glory. Lift your heads, you gates, rise up, ancient doors, that the king of glory can come in. Who is the king of glory? Well, he's the only one worthy of worship. And in his incarnation, he's the king who sometimes comes in disguise. He's the incognito king. I mean, who would have recognized a king in an infant born to a Nazarene peasant and her working class husband? Only Joseph and Mary, a few Jewish shepherds, and some Gentile magi to whom it was revealed Did the average citizens of Bethlehem kneel at the manger and worship baby Jesus? No. Why would they? He seemed like any other ordinary baby to them. Who would have recognized the king in a 12-year-old boy asking questions of the rabbis in the temple? I mean, he's 12 years old, smarter than most, asks better questions, has deeper insight, but a king? No way. And who would have recognized the king in young men baptized by John in the River Jordan? John knew he was baptizing a king. Nobody else had a clue. Lots of people were baptized. None of them were kings. And who would have recognized the king in the young man, Jesus, unfolding, reading the Isaiah scroll in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And today, Jesus said, this scripture has been fulfilled. Did they suspect that they were in the presence of a king? No. Isn't that Joe and Mary's boy? Yeah, I used to rock that little toddler and sing psalms to him in the nursery synagogue. Yeah, well, when we were boys, he and I made slingshots, and we used to fling rocks together at imaginary Goliaths on the hillside. Before Jesus was done preaching that day, his sermon riled up his homies enough that they tried to throw him off a cliff. A king? They didn't see him that way. Who would have expected a king to enter Jerusalem at the Passover riding on the back of a donkey's colt? Don't kings ride white stallions? And yet some wondered, is, is, is this, could this be our king? Is this fulfillment of that Zechariah prophecy? Tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Is this Israel's king? Maybe. I mean, some believed they rolled out that day's version of the red carpet composed of the cloaks off their back and of branches that had been stripped from nearby trees. Hosanna to the son of King David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. Many suspected a king. 
Some thought him only a prophet. Religious leaders thought him a madman heretic whose annex would spoil their ancient religion and bring Roman retribution to the city. But even those who supposed him a king thought better of it by week's end. And Jesus formed no army, gathered no weapons, did nothing to try to oust Rome from the city. Some king. Maybe he is a madman. There would be no coronation in that Passover season. There would be this instead. Jesus betrayed by Judas, denied by Peter, abandoned by his friends, tried and found guilty by Jewish authorities on a blasphemy charge, handed over to the governor, Roman governor Pontius Pilate, on a sedition charge in the hopes that he would hang Jesus on a cross. Pilate was curious. Are you the king of Israel, as some say? My kingdom's not of this world, Jesus answered. Pilate found no fault in him, thought him largely harmless, a victim of the envy of Jewish leaders. So Pilate asked the crowd to weigh in, you have this custom that I release one prisoner to you at the Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? No. Barabbas. Release Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. I mean, what's a politician to do? The expedient thing, of course. What's one more dead Jew if it averts a riot and wins a few votes? And so Pilate handed him over to his soldiers to be flogged, beaten with rods, whipped with leather straps, tipped with sharp iron and bits of bone. And then after the flogging, a crown of thorns and a purple robe for this clown king, and then a cross. Spikes sledgehammered through hands and feet, cross hoisted high, dropped into its hole, and Jesus left, left to bleed out and suffocate in view of everyone on Skull Hill that day. Jesus left to endure the insults of a mocking crowd who took sinister joy in kicking a man while he's down, so down that he thought even God had abandoned him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Total condescension, total humiliation. The worst of the worst, the lowest of the low. A nearly naked, impaled king in a hoisted hailstorm of contempt. Exactly what our sin deserves. Not what sinless Jesus deserves. But he bore our sin in his body as the perfect sacrificial lamb without blemish. Jesus stooped that low out of love for his father, love for us. I mean, how low can you go? No lower than that. Some king, huh? Can't, won't rally his troops. Instead of cursing those who betray him, beat him, and nail him to a cross, he forgives them. He lifts not a single finger to defend himself, help himself, free himself. It's as if he wanted this to happen. Is there any other king who would go down without swinging? Any king you know of who would make a sacrifice of himself for his people? And not just a sacrifice of his body, but by bearing the sins of his people in his own sinless self. Jesus becoming sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus paying our sin debt so we can be forgiven of our sins, brought into eternal relationship and life with God. Our judge paid our fine. Our king, wearing a crown of thorns, took his place on a cross-shaped throne and died in our place so that we might live. If you're in the house today and you do not know this king, give your life to him now. Jesus is the king in disguise. It's so preposterous to out onlookers that some years later a drawing was found on the walls of the catacombs beneath Rome. The drawing shows a man's body hanging on a cross, has the head of a mule, and next to the cross is a stick figure of a man, his hand raised in worship to the half mule, half man on the cross. And the inscription underneath reads, Alexamenos worships his God. It was a cartoon, it was a satire, it was an insult. A crucified God, what a joke. A crucified king who died without a fight, describes no king ever. 
The God-man Jesus is the incognito king, the king in disguise. Most kings have unlimited access to whatever they want, whatever they need. They either buy it or they take it. Not King Jesus. Didn't own anything but the clothes on his back and the sh soldiers threw dice for those while he hung on the cross. What kind of king is this? I mean, he borrows everything. Birthed in a borrowed stable, rode into Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey, ate his last meal in a borrowed room, crucified on a borrowed cross, buried in a borrowed tomb. A tomb he didn't borrow for very long. He was crucified and buried on Friday, and then after plundering death on Saturday, he had all the death he was going to take, and he rose from the dead on Sunday. And in his resurrection, he shed his disguise and appeared as king of kings and lord of lords, a king with nail scars in his hands and a jagged scar in his ribs, but very much alive. Do you know any other kings in history who rose from their grave? Only Jesus, king of kings, king over life, king over death, king over his friends, king over his enemies, and not just a king for a day, a decade, a century, a millennium, a king forever. There would be no mistaking his kingship now. It's no wonder the psalmist calls us to worship him. Lift up your heads, you gates, rise up. Ancient doors, then the king of glory will come in. Now whether the psalmist has in mind the the doors of the temple or the doors of heaven. Here's what he means. You're going to need bigger doors if you're going to get the king of glory in there. I mean, he is the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. The Lord of armies. He took on the corrupt powers of organized religion. One. He took on the corrupt powers of Roman Empire politics. One. Took on the pervasive corruption of our sin. One. He took on his arch enemy, Satan, crushed his head and won. And he took on the last enemy, death, kicked his tail, plundered his house, took his keys, and won. So, so hey, temple, hey, heaven, you're going to need bigger doors to get the king of glory in there. He's big, and he's vast, and he's strong, and he's mighty, and he's grace, and he's mercy, and he's peace, and he's love. You're going to need wider doors, higher doors to let him in. He is the king of glory. So rise up, ancient doors. Then the king of glory will come in. So on this Wednesday after Easter, rise up all of you who know this king and love this king. Rise up and worship and praise and thanksgiving and confession and in obedience. Rise up and worship the king who created the earth, who came as the God-man through virgin birth and who is of highest worth. Rise up and worship this king who is the sin taker, the way maker, the devil breaker, the death shaker, and the peacemaker between God and us, between us and others. Rise up and worship this king who forgives error is the burden bearer, the love sharer, a holy terror, and the repair of all things broken in our lives. Rise up and worship this king who calls us away from our deviance into his obedience so that his radiance might show through our lives. Rise up and worship this king who is the salvation achiever for every believer by forgiving our every sin and misdemeanor. Rise up and worship this king who made himself a sacrifice by say, paying sin's price so we could be born twice into faithful lives and live forever with him in paradise. Rise up and worship this king who rose from the dead to deliver us from its dread doing all of this in our stead. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, O ancient doors. Then the king of glory will come in. Who is this king of glory, strong and mighty? The Lord strong and mighty in battle, the Lord of armies. Jesus is the king of glory. Rise up and worship him. Worship him with your lips. Worship him with your life. Worship him now. Worship him forever. Hallelujah. Amen.
after prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, again, thank you for this powerful word that we've heard today. Thank you that we do have a king of glory who has come in, that he has risen from the dead and that we do have hope in him and life in him. And help us take seriously the words that we've heard today. We ask these things in the mighty name of that king, King Jesus. Amen.